something a little different tonight. Here's a song that Velda and I wrote. I stumbled through the dark of guilt and misery Working for the devil day and night But Jesus led my way when the gospel I believed He passed me from death unto life From death and the grave Jesus made me rise From hell and the worm that never dies And long before this body turns to dust where it lies He passed me from death unto life Yes, he did He passed me from death unto life All the sin I done would plunge me to the pit And for my crimes I'd pay forevermore But Jesus said, don't worry, I paid for all of it And I'll meet you when you reach that farther shore From death and the grave, Jesus made me rise From hell and the worm that never dies And long before this body turns to dust where it lies He passed me from death unto life Yes, he did He passed me from death unto life appreciate folks listening and uh, Lord I just ask you to be with us all as we live through this plague I'm thankful that so far it's not touched anyone in my house and I'm grateful for that Lord but as I say every day you're well able to to stop it you're well able to heal those that have it but your will be done in the name of Jesus. And I ask that, uh, that you would bring a blessing on everybody that hears this recording. In Jesus' name, amen. He passed me from death unto life. Jesus said that he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. We're going to be in, in Acts chapter 17. And Paul the Apostle has gone to Athens and he winds up there by himself and he's, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy. And uh, in verse 15 it says that, And they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him, with all speed they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. You know, Athens was a great city and it had all these temples. They had the, they had the temple to Venus and to Zeus and to, and to, and to Ares and all the, all the Greek gods. All these, these, all these gods, they had their own temples, and they had their own priests, you know. And the Roman, uh, in the Roman language, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> it 
it was it was Mars and and uh, and Jupiter, they, but it was the same God. You know that you had like the head honcho God, and then you had the the goddess of fertility. You had the god of war, the god of the underworld, and so forth. Uh, and they were totally given unto idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And that was Paul's custom. Every time he went to a town that he had not been to before, he, the first place he went was the synagogue. Because A, he was a Jew, and he was wanting to preach Christ to the Jews. And he was wanting them to come to a saving knowledge of Christ and, and, to, and to understand that... that uh, that in Jesus Christ was a fulfillment to all the promises made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, and that, that it was only only right that he should go first to the Jews, to his own people. And and there was a synagogue in every city. You know, Greek was not a Jewish place. Uh, Greece wasn't. Uh, they're in Athens. But you see, uh, after the Babylonian captivity, very few of the Jews returned to Judah and to Jerusalem. Everywhere they went, they established synagogues where they would read the scripture and preach and talk and discuss the Lord and worship. And they had they had their their, their religious life there in those synagogues. And uh, and and they were they were very faithful in this. So you know, every Sabbath day, Paul would go and he would talk to them in the synagogues about Jesus. And then certain philosophies, philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, well, what will this babbler say? And some, and other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him unto Areopagus, saying, uh, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. You know, Areopagus, it was the, it was the, Ares was the, was the, was this, was the god that, uh, that they took it to Mars, Mars in the, in the, uh, in the, in the Latin, in the Romans, you know, worshiped Mars, the god of war, and then, then you had, you had Ares, the, the god of war, and the, in the uh, in the Greek pantheon, and so uh, they called it Areopagus. Areopagus, but it was, uh, folks. You have to forgive me. I'm just. I guess I'm tired or tongue tied or something. Let me just say that they they took him up to Areopagus, which was a temple and a meeting place. And, uh, and it's where they went every day to talk about things, to talk about religion, to talk about philosophy, uh, to talk about politics, to talk about all this stuff. It was, the, it was where they had the exchange of minds and ideas. And, uh, and they, they asked Paul, said, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, and would, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Huh. That, that reminds me of where we are today. It seems like that's all anybody is interested in is to see or to tell or to hear some new thing. Um, you know, I guess I'm kind of old school, especially when it comes when it comes to the things of God. If it's new, it ain't true. And if it's true, it ain't new. You can almost hit your wagon to that. And it'll be true almost every time. If you had to bet it every time, you would wind up rich. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They had so many gods that they worshipped that they had a, a tomb to the unknown God. 
you know, kind of like we have a tomb to the unknown soldier because we don't know who's there. It's the, it's the unidentified parts of our warriors that we've, that we've laid to rest there. Uh, and it's in their honor that we honor them even though we could not identify who they were. Well, this is kind of a perversion of that because Paul said that they were really superstitious. And they they had worship, and boy, they were really dedicated to worship because they had all these temples up here on this hill. They had all these priests, all these places to worship to all these different gods. And they even built a temple to the unknown God. And I guess that's in case they left anybody out that they didn't want to they didn't want this God that they left out to curse them with a drought or a plague or an earthquake or a volcano or something that would destroy them. So they decided to worship this unknown God. Paul says, I'm going to preach to you the unknown God. And it's in a sense he was going to preach to them the God that they didn't know, who was the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we have to do today, beloved. It's not like it was when we were kids. When I preach today, I'm preaching the unknown God. Oh, everybody knows Jesus. and He was in that movie that Mel Gibson made, remember? And, uh, and he was on TV in that TV show that Roman Downey made. They all know who Jesus is. But uh, they just know him like they know they know who Oliver Twist is in the Charles Dickens book. And like they know who Harry Potter is in a Harry Potter book. He's just another character to them. He's not the God who lives forever. He's not, in fact, the only God there ever was or ever will be. He is not the risen Christ who is returning to earth to reign with a rod of iron. He's the unknown God. So every time I preach in public, I am preaching the unknown God. When I was a boy, we had a cultural Christianity. Everybody, more or less, whether they went to church or not, they thought it was good if you did go. Uh, whether they believed in Christ or not, they thought it was a good thing if you did believe in Christ. It was just There was just a general consensus in the country, in the world at the time, although it was already fading in Europe. We're living in an almost pagan society now. And I see, I see the gods of, of ancient times rising up in different forms. They're, they're demons, you know. Baal, Ashtoreth, Molech. You see, Baal was the Baal was the god of false worship, of false gods, of turning to idols. It was the, like the gateway god. Then Ashtoreth under many different names. It was the god of fertility and the the bull was his symbol. That's why it was so horrible when the children of Israel sinned while Moses was on top of Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. They made them golden calves. Well they made the they made the bulls, the Ashtoreth, the fertility symbols. And when Moses comes down from the hill he finds a bunch of them having an orgy they were worshiping the god of that. And then Molech was the god that uh, the people of the land sacrificed their children unto. They killed their children. They killed their babies and shed innocent blood which, which God will not let stand. So we live 
in an age where God has been pushed from the public square, pushed out of the schools, pushed out of education, pushed out of government, pushed out of most homes, and beloved, many of my colleagues are the worst among us because Jesus Christ is being pushed out of churches. All we care about is what kind of music do we have and how big a building do we have and how much money are we taking in. I never thought that was what it was all about. So when I preach Jesus Christ in 2020, I'm preaching about the unknown God because I dwell in a land that doesn't know him. He is a great and mighty God and he can do anything. He can save to the uttermost. He can forgive any and all sin. He can take what was broken and make it whole. To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek after the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Racism? No. Paul says there ain't no difference. Rich and poor? Ain't no difference. Male and female? Ain't no difference. Not in the sight of God. For in him we live and move and we have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the Godhead like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. And at the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's another thing you don't hear today. Repent. Sin is not something to boast of to applaud, to tolerate, to endure. It's to be repented of. Repented of it means you turn around and go the other way. You leave it behind. And you don't go that way again. That's what repentance is. Whether it hurts or not, a lot of times it does. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Of course, he's talking about Jesus. <laughs> and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. <laughs> Gee, look at the time. Got to go. We got to go now. You see, as long as Jesus is a great teacher, people will listen. Now, as long as he's a prophet, people will listen. As long as he's the baby Jesus in a manger, they'll listen. As long as he's the dying Jesus on a cross, they'll listen. And they'll listen while he's being whipped and scourged and beaten and mocked and spit on. They'll listen during that. They'll say, yes, everything he said was wonderful. And we love his words. And we... And we, we try to practice his teachings. But once you say that all judgment, all honor, all glory, all power is given to the Son of God because he rose from the dead, that's when they quit listening. You see how weird I am? I believe that a man who used to be dead is going to appear one day in the eastern sky in a flame of fire. 
and say, Jimmy, it's time for you to come home. You're out of here. In order to do that, he had to rise from the dead. It's always the resurrection that trips people up. You know, it's just a few days off. I heard somebody say today was Maundy Thursday, and I wish they'd make up their mind. Is it Maundy or is it Thursday? I just don't know. I, I know that I'm different today than I usually am. I know that I stumbled and staggered at the first of the message because of the burden that I carried. My job as a pastor is to comfort. Or as, uh, I forget who said it, somebody famous said that the job of a pastor is to, is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I forget who said that. One of my smart preacher friends, you might remember who said that. And the job of an evangelist, which I am, and I do the work of an evangelist, as Paul exhorted Timothy, is to tell people about Jesus and try to press them to a decision to give their life to him. And I've done that pretty, pretty steadily. But the job of a prophet is to tell you that the God who lives forever is not happy about certain things and he's not well pleased about certain things. And so sometimes I have to say heavy things. We like to think of ourselves as a Christian nation. If we were a Christian nation, we wouldn't look the way we do. We'd treat each other differently. We'd act differently. Everything would be different. We're not even a Christian society anymore. Because God has been driven from the square. By us. And it's not the government's fault. And it's not the atheist's fault. And it's not the non believer or semi believer's fault. It's not the practitioners of other religions' fault. The fault is mine as a Christian. The fault is the church of Jesus Christ for allowing it to happen. And so, like Paul, on Mars Hill, he was grieved over a nation completely given over to idolatry. And I believe that it's where we either are or almost are. So here today I sit and tell you about the unknown God. His name is Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin. He was lived a perfect, sinless life. He was crucified. He was buried in the grave. He rose the third day. He's coming back to judge the quick and the dead. And he'll reign forever in glory. His name is Jesus, and to too many he is the unknown God. I love you, beloved. I'll try to be of lighter heart tomorrow.